or 1711. In 1732 she earned a degree of doctor in philosophy from the University of Bologna. A few months later, because of her remarkable scientific skills, the Senate of the University assigned her an honorary position at the chair of Philosophia Universa that is, of natural philosophy. In the first 1711, years, the young woman continued to study. In 1738, she married Giuseppe Veratti, a doctor in medicine who shared with his wife a keen interest in the study of nature. In 1745, Pope Benedict XIII admitted Laura Bassi among the elite group of scholars named Benedictine academics, but only as a supernumerary and not without resistance. Filling this role, she had to present at least one original dissertation a year. In this way, Laura played an active role inside the Bolognese scientific community. For performing her talks, Laura carried out several experiments with her husband in her own home, in a special laboratory that the couple had equipped with the most advanced tools and machines of the time. This laboratory was used not only for her personal research, but also for the private lessons in experimental physics that Laura Bassi held for philosophy and medical students of the university. The almost 30 years of high-level lessons held by Laura at her home earned her the assignment of the position, this time effective, of Professor of Experimental Physics in the Institute of Sciences in 1776. Only two years later, on the morning of February 20, 1778, Laura Bassi died suddenly, after having participated in a session of the Academy of Sciences the previous evening. This woman, a forerunner of female emancipation, remains an admirable example for all women of science still today. Thank you for the video. So um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Neige Franco to you. She uh, she's from France. She got her undergraduate degree at Toulouse University, and she completed her master's degree at Lund University. Then she proceeded to go to the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, where she got her PhD in 2020. She is at the moment a postdoctoral um, postdoctoral researcher at MPIA, and she will move to Toronto in September. She will speak today um, about, I assume, what was her uh, PhD dissertation, and the title of her talk is What Sets the Structure of the Milky Way Disk? Insights from Gaia and Cosmological Simulations. Um, start whenever you're ready, Naj. I should also say something that I forgot. Since it's a vacation day in Germany today, Paige is giving her talk from home where she doesn't have a great connection. And so she will be sharing a screen, but you will most often not be seeing her face as her connection does not allow for both things to happen reliably at the same time. Okay. I'm not sure whether we have lost Nage because she is does not appear. 
to be on. Anymore. Can you hear me now? I yes, think I'm yes, back. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. You okay, can start. I think there should be no more problem now. Um, okay, great. You can start. Yeah. Okay, so now you should see my first slide. Perfectly well. Go ahead. Great. So thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, Laura Bassi series to tell you about the Milky Way and how we can use it to understand galaxy evolution in a more global context. So the Milky Way is a rather typical galaxy. It has a typical mass, a typical morphology. It has a disk, a bar, spiral arms. But since we, we are sitting inside its disk, we can study it in star by star and see much more detail than in external galaxies. So we start with a few questions that are general to disk galaxies, and then we'll move on to the Milky Way. And the first observation that we can have is that when you look at the surface brightness profile of disk galaxies, you see that they almost all the time look like exponentials. And the question is, do these galaxies form on exponential profiles, or do they become exponentials through some evolutionary process? But what makes it so universal? Another question is, if you look at uh, this galaxy face on in the UV, where the light traces the distribution of the young stars, you see that there is a lot of structure. It's very messy, very clumpy. Now, if you look at the same galaxy in infrared, where the light traces the overall mass distribution, it looks much smoother. And similarly, the picture on the left has a galaxy that looks bigger than the picture on the right. And does it mean that the stars that are forming today form on bigger spatial scales than stars that formed in the past? And is that a sign of inside out growth? So really the question is how do you go from the picture on the left to that on the right? And thinking about inside out growth, there is another way to uh, look at it. That is if you look at disk galaxies at different times, at different redshifts, you can see if they were smaller in the past. So this has been done before. So here you have the x-axis is redshift. So it goes um, the opposite direction as time. The y-axis is galaxy sizes. And you have five lines for galaxies of different stellar mass. And here what you should notice is that at given stellar mass, galaxies seem to look smaller in the past. So it seems to have some uh, evidence for inside out growth. But when we think a little bit about it, inside out growth, you would have a potential well that will make your future galaxy in which gas of low angular momentum falls to the center, cools down, makes stars on some star formation time scale. And while this happens, you would have higher angular momentum gas that falls a bit later to the potential well, not to the center because it has higher angular momentum, cools down, form stars on a different star formation time scale. And you can repeat that to even higher angular momentum gas. So you end up with a disk of stars that formed at different times at different places. So now if we try to make a mass weighted age profile of the stars in that disk, we would expect an age gradient where on average stars in the center are older than stars in the outskirts. People have done that uh, looking at IFU studies. So you take um, many spectra in the same galaxies in different pixels. And in each pixel, you can roughly know what is the age distribution of the stars. You do that for many galaxies, you're stuck, you stack them, and you make that exactly the same plot. So this is exactly what you see. So the y-axis is log age, the x-axis is radius, and this horizontal line is the average age profile. And it seems that on average, this profile looks flat and is consistent with a gradient of zero. So does that mean that finally there is no inside out growth or can we, how can we reconcile these two pictures? So I summarize now the few questions that we have in mind. The first one is what drives messiness to the smooth exponential profiles of disk galaxies? We know that phase mixing happens that can smooth it all. For example, stars that are born are roughly at the same radius, if you wait for long enough, they will reach different phases and be mixed. Do they mix in the other direction, in the radial direction or not? And the second question is, do these galaxies grow from inside out? 
Now imagine if we had one galaxy, just one, to which we can ask, where are your stars today? And where were your stars born? How much insights it would bring to these two questions? And this is what we're about to do now, zoom in on to the Milky Way. So the, the great thing about the Milky Way is that we have a lot of star by star information. We have 3D positions, 3D velocities, metallicities and ages for many of its stars. So we can take the Milky Way and ask what processes set the structure of the Milky Way disk over the past six to seven giga year. When I say processes, I mean we're going to build a scenario, have a parametric model that will be encoded in parameters theta and we want to fit them robustly against the data set. And the structure will be encoded in that data set. Now to simplify a little bit this picture, I will start by simplifying the data using only three dimensions. So instead of using 3D positions and 3D velocities, we're going to start with only the galactocentric radius. That will already tell us a lot. Now the data, I'm using the red clump stars from the Apogee survey. And for about 7,000 stars, we know the 6D phase space information, metallicity, and good ages. And the good thing about this data set is that you can see on the left-hand side, it covers a wide range of galactocentric radii. So this makes it a good data set to study the processes that can shape shape the overall galaxy, or at least the disk. So now we could take this data set and split it in two. We look at the young stars on one side and the old stars on the other side, and try to find if there is any difference between the two. So here I show you the metallicity profile of the young red clump stars in my data set. And what you see is that there is a metallicity gradient. Stars in the inner disk are more metal rich than stars in the outer disk. And uh, there is not much scatter in that relation. It's relatively tight. If you make exactly the same plot for the old stars, you see that there is much more scatter. So if we think about the evolution of stars and the fact that they roughly keep their metallicity in their atmosphere throughout their lifetime. The only thing that could change on that plot is the x-axis. Stars don't change metallicity, but they can change radius. So we could ask, is that a sign of secular evolution? If you eyeball the size of my red arrows, you would find that approximately the scatter is about 3 kiloparsec or 3.5 kiloparsec. But now we need to make a, a proper model to measure this uh, robustly. So now I move on to the model that will be inspired by these observations. So this is a very simple model for how the Milky Way disk could have uh, formed and evolved. And the first aspect is to form stars. You make a star formation history, you give stars a birthday and a birthplace, then you give them a metallicity, and then you let their orbits evolve. So my star formation history model is very simple. Roughly stars would be born on some exponential profile. And as time goes, maybe this exponential uh, goes to larger scale lengths, which would mean maybe there is inside out growth. So I have a parameter for this to set the degree of inside out growth. And if there is no inside out growth, I will fit that there is no inside out growth. It just allowed in the model. The other aspect, their metallicity. So this is not a physical chemical enrichment model. This is more data driven uh, chemical enrichment model where I make a few assumptions. First, there is always an a negative metallicity gradient in the gas. There are no azimuthal variations in the gas metallicity. And uh, metallicity increases monotonically with time. So that, that would be translated by supernovae keep exploding and enriching the gas uh, as time goes. So this is roughly what it would look like. I have three parameters for this. Metallicity increases with time. It's more metal rich in the inner disk than in the outer disk. And finally, the important aspect is uh, the radial mixing process. So the idea is that stars would be born uh, somewhere in the disk. And as time goes, they can change orbits and spread in radius. So this would happen roughly everywhere and at all times. So now we have a global uh, average over the galactic disk. And how I parameterized it is 
stars have a probability p to be at radius r today, given they were born at radius r not some time tau ago. And this is parameterized with distributions that broaden, and the broadening goes as a function of time, such that stars that are really young should be close to their birthplace, and stars that are old had more time to change orbit. So it would look like this. So here I have three stars that are born at 8, 10, and 12 kiloparsec. And as time goes, their PDF increases as a function of time and broadens. And what we want to measure really is how much does this distribution broaden? So we want to constrain that. So now I showed you three simple model aspects. We can put them together, build a likelihood function, constrain it against the data set, and now I show you the posterior distribution of all these model parameters. So first radial mixing, then you can constrain star formation history and the enrichment. And I'm only showing that plot to show that the fitting went uh, well. Now, if we focus on radial mixing, and the number that we get out is that after six giga years, stars have spread on a scale of about three kiloparsec. So this is really close to the eyeball measurement of our red arrow earlier in the talk. And three kiloparsec is an important number because it's really close to the scale length of the Milky Way disk. So this is a scale that allows us to measure the size of the galactic disk. So this is a large number. Stars spread a lot in radius. So now if we come back to our earlier question, why are disks smooth if star formation is structured and clumpy? So we have phase mixing, and then if this radial mixing process is universal, then it could also explain these smooth profiles. So if we come back to the early questions we had, we have phase mixing, and now we also have radial mixing that can smooth the profiles of galaxies. But that doesn't explain the exponentials. And that doesn't uh, tell us how the stars change orbit, what happened to them. So now we can look at that question. So now we can come back to the model of before, where I, I just simplified it with three variables. We can put back the 3D positions and the 3D velocities and use the information from Gaia and change a little bit the model to understand how stars change orbit, really. So how can you change the orbit of a star? Imagine you have a star that is born on a roughly circular orbit. What can you do to change it? The first thing that comes to my mind is you change the size of the orbit, which means you only change the angular momentum of the orbit. Or you could change the shape of the orbit. So you give a kick in the velocity in the star, and it changes the shape. It becomes eccentric. And you can measure that with this quantity called the radial action. It's the integral of the radial velocity of the star along the orbit. If you're on, on a circular orbit, this radial velocity is zero, radial action is zero. So this is like eccentricity. If you are on an eccentric orbit, this number will be positive. And the good reason why one should work with this quantity is that it has the same dimensions as angular momentum. It's a velocity time and distance. So now when we can constrain these two numbers, we can compare them directly one-on-one. -on -one. So changing only the angular momentum of an orbit is like cold torquing. You apply a, a torque, but you keep the orbit cold. And changing the shape is like a radial heating. And if you want typical numbers for uh, angular momentum in the galactic disk, you could take the sun is at 8 kiloparsec. It rotates about the galactic center roughly at 240 kilometers per second. So a typical number for angular momentum would be 2,000 kiloparsec kilometers per second. And the typical number for radial action is roughly the size of the epicycle uh, of the orbit. So it would be the size of that orbit, roughly one kiloparsec or something, times the velocity dispersion of the stars at that position. So if, if we say it's about one kiloparsec and 30 kilometers per second, a typical number for radial action would be 30 kiloparsec kilometers per second. So this is just to give you an intuition of these numbers. So changing the shape of an orbit is easy. I mean, the star just meets a molecular cloud or a spiral arm and it's kicked in velocity space and the orbit becomes eccentric. But how do you change only the angular momentum. How do you go from a circular orbit to another circular orbit? It sounds like you need something special to do that. 
And in 2002, Salwood and Binet came with a, a specific process that happens at the corrotation resonance. So if you imagine the velocity profile of different structures in the disk, you would have the stars on a flat rotation curve. And then you could have some perturbation that rotates like a solid body, for example, a bar or spiral arm. And where the two lines intersect, the stars and the perturbation rotate at the same speed. So they will interact for a long time. So here the effect will be stronger. <laughs> Did I hear something? No, okay. So then they will interact for a long time. And inside the correlation, the stars are faster and outside it, they are slower. And there will be some uh, interesting interplay between these two at this place. So now I show you a movie. It's the same movie in two different frames of what happens at the corrotation resonance. You have a star that's really close to it and is getting pulled by a spiral arm in front of it. It gains angular momentum and moves outwards, but it is slower than the spiral arms. So the spiral arm behind it is catching up. It exerts a negative torque on the star. That's easier to see on the right-hand side. The star loses angular momentum moves inside co-rotation and starts to rotate faster than the spiral arms. Now what happens, it rotates faster, so it's catching up the spiral arm in front of it. Then it will receive a positive torque by that spiral, move outside co-rotation, and now it's trapped on horseshoe orbit. Now this could be ongoing forever, but if the spiral arms are not long-lived structures, but if they appear and disappear on short time scales, then the star will only live on a small portion of that horseshoe orbit. And as different spirals come and go with different strengths, different pattern speeds, they will just shuffle the star's orbits. It's a bit like a stochastic process where stars would do a random walk in angular momentum. And as you can see on the left-hand side now, the orbits of the star roughly looks circular, like, you know, the lines really don't uh, cross match. So now we can do a very sim similar experiment, but instead of looking only at one star, we look at many stars that are born exactly on the same orbit, but at different phases. They will experience the spiral arms differently because they will feel them at different phases. I won't run exactly the same movie because it's going to be very messy. So instead we can just track the angular momentum of each of these stars. So that's what you are going to see. On the left-hand side, we'll just see the angular momentum distribution of the stars. So the y-axis is angular momentum and the x-axis will be the PDF. Right now, the movie hasn't started. All the stars are on the same orbit. So you have a Dirac function of where my stars are. On the left-hand side, you will see time on the x-axis and angular momentum again on the y-axis. So far, you only see one star at zero because we haven't started. They are all together at a specific angular momentum. The background tells you when I apply my spirals. So here I just put spirals in and I make them appear and disappear on short time scales to see what happens to the stars. When it's dark, it means there will be a spiral arm. And when it's white, there will be a very weak spiral if there is any. So now I launch it and all the stars that were born on the same orbit, suddenly they start to move apart. And their PDF just broadens as a function of time. Such that four giga year later, they're all on different orbits, although they were born together on a circular orbit. Now this is good, but the problem is that for the Milky Way, we can't do exactly this exercise because we don't have an inventory of all the spiral arms that came and went. But we can use the same trick as before. That is, we know the star's colors. We know the star's metallicity. So that two stars that have the same age, if one is more metal rich than the other one, probably it will come from the inner disk. So it's the same trick as before. And I can just show you my new version of the modeling. Stars the same. Stars are born on near circular orbits. They have a birthplace, a birthday. They have a tight relation between metallicity and birthplace. So here again, you see a, a metallicity gradient. As radius increases, metallicity decreases. And this plot shows lines that were made at different times. As time goes, 
metallicity increases in the disk. And finally, the orbits evolve. So now you have a diffusion process in angular momentum that could be perhaps explained by spiral arms, but we don't know. This is very empirical. And you have a radial heating, so we change the shape of stellar orbits. Now I'm going to show you the plane that is interesting, the orbit plane, that is the plane of angular momentum and radial action. And we're going to see how the model predicts that the stars spread on that plane. So you have the x-axis is angular momentum, the y-axis is radial action. Low angular momentum means that you are in the inner disk. The high angular momentum means you're in the outer disk. If you have no radial action, you are in a circular orbit. If you have a high radial action, you're on an eccentric orbit. If you have no angular momentum and a non-zero radial action, you're on a radial orbit. So now we take a star that is born on a circular orbit somewhere in the disk. So it's, uh, it's down here. It has no radial action. It's somewhere in angular momentum. And now it is zero giga year old. As time goes, it can spread somewhere in the disk. It can go to the inner disk or outer disk. It can increase its eccentricity. And as time goes, this PDF broadens with time, the same as before, but now it's in two dimensions. And what we want to know is how wide that distribution is in the x-axis in angular momentum. Same as before, it's going to be a strength and have a time dependence. And the y-axis, it's exactly the same how much to stars spread in radial action, you would have a strength and a time dependence. And we want to fit for both and plot them as a function of time. So now you take the model, you put it all together and you can write a likelihood function. So you need the overall Milky Way model. You need to know how the stars were selected to end up in your data set, because this is important not to model the stars that you don't see. For example, stars that are hidden behind the dust. I should inform my model that they won't end up in my data set. So this funny plot with the green lines tells us that we're sitting at eight kiloparsec at zero. So the sun is in the center and each line is where the telescope pointed to collect information of stars in the disk. And we have not much information in the mid plane of the disk because there's a lot of dust and all that. So you need to model that accurately. And then you take everything together, you get again a posterior distribution for the model parameters. Now the two interesting parameters were um, angular momentum and the radial action, how much they spread with time. So this is what you get for angular momentum. The spread increases as a function of time. So a star that is zero giga year old is still at its birthplace, at its birth angular momentum. And the star that is six giga year old may have spread on a scale of 600 kiloparsec kilometers per second. This number is about a third of the angular momentum of the sun. Now, stars spread on radial action on a different scale. They, now it's around 60 kiloparsec kilometers per second. And the first thing that we can notice about these two numbers is that they differ by a factor 10. So the diffusion in angular momentum is 10 times stronger than that in radial heating. And this can have important implications because the orbits can evolve by a lot, but without much heating. So you can have a star that is on a circular orbit in the Milky Way today, but it can come from somewhere else. And you won't see it in the kinematics. You may see it in the chemistry only. Now this can have other important implications. It means that most of the radial changes that we talked about before could be due to angular momentum diffusion. And now if you say, I have a very efficient process of diffusion in angular momentum, this could maximize, by maximizing the entropy of that distribution, this could lead the angular momentum distribution to an exponential. And if you translate that to radius, this could also lead the disk to have an exponential profile. So again, if this process were universal, it could provide one more explanation for the exponential profiles that we see in disk galaxies. So we come back to these two questions. So radial migration could be one candidate explanation for the exponential profiles. And we're left with the second question, do these galaxies grow from inside out? Well, now we have a best fit Milky Way model. So we can just make a Milky Way and predict uh, how much it grew, if it grew from inside out or not. 
So I recap the two um, plots that we had before that were a bit in tension. You had the redshift size relations on one side that said, oh, galaxies look smaller in the past. And the other plot that was saying, yes, but um, I don't see any age gradient, at least on average. So which one of these two will the Milky Way agree with? We can remake exactly these two plots with the Milky Way with the best fit model. So I can take the best fit star formation history that tells us at each galactocentric radius when this star, did the stars form. So at four kiloparsec, it looks like this. At six kiloparsec, the star formation time scale is a bit longer. And at different radii, you have different forms. So now you can produce a mock Milky Way and plot the size as a function of look back time. And what you see is that look back time zero, so today, the half mass radius is about six kiloparsec. And about six or seven giga year ago, the half mass radius was about four kiloparsec. So there is some sign of inside out growth. Now, if you want to compare this more quantitatively to observations, it's not the half mass radius that you want, it's the half light radius. So now we need to account for the fact that young stars are brighter and old stars are redder and all this. So you, you model populations. And this is what you would get, at least for the DSSR band, um, the half light radius now. And if you compare that to the, the previous plot, the lines that were corresponding to stellar mass that are like that of the Milky Way, you see that these two lines overlap. So this would mean that the Milky Way is a rather uh, typical galaxy, not just in terms of uh, present day structure, but perhaps also in terms of evolution and build up. Okay, so now the Milky Way agrees with the redshift size relation. How about the age profiles? And I can also make a mock Milky Way and plot the mass weighted age profile. So this is what you have. On the Y axis, you have log age. On the X axis, you have distance from the center in units of effective radius. The background red uh, line is the, the manga plot I showed you before with the flat age profile. And the black line is the best fit Milky Way. And this looks also uh, flat. So the Milky Way agree with both plots. And there is no really contradiction between the two of them. And one way to explain this, if we can assume that it's only physical explanation for this, is that radial migration weakens gradient. So here you have two plots, the H profile and the metallicity profile. And as I increase radial migration, the initial gradients that were present in the disk get completely wiped out. And the second thing that you should note is on the top uh, panel, uh, the age, uh, the mean age as a function of radius goes on the y-axis scale between three and 4.5 giga year. So this is already a weak edge gradient that was produced by this star formation history. So the age gradient is weak and radial migration weakens it even more. So now if we come back to our initial question, do these galaxies grow from inside out? For the Milky Way disk, it's the growth of about 40% over the past seven giga year. So if the Milky Way is like uh, other disk galaxies, then okay, that could explain uh, why there are um, no edge gradients, but still some inside out growth. So now we have uh, talked a lot about how stars change orbits, but we don't know what drives orbit uh, migration. Uh, I've talked about structures, but I haven't constrained any of them. And to do that now, we, we should turn to simulations, not to a descriptive model, to learn more about the dynamics. And this is quite complicated because the Milky Way uh, evolved and um, got built up in a cosmological context where it has you know, a bar and spiral perturbations that cause internal processes to affect the stars, but you also have external perturbations, past mergers and present day satellites that can also excite the orbits of the stars. So to study that, it's interesting to look at cosmological simulations that have a realistic setup. So in a realistic context, what we would like to have ideally is to study disk galaxies that have bars and spirals such that they are a bit like the Milky Way. Uh, they have satellites and mergers that can affect the orbits of stars and the resolution should be high enough to resolve these structures and their effects. 
And we want a large statistical sample to know how often these kind of events happen, like how many galaxies have strong radial migration and all that. So now if we look at existing simulations, you can have high or low resolution and that will set how many uh, galaxies you can look at, knowing that if you want more galaxies at higher resolution, it's going to be computationally very expensive. On the top left, you have typically zoom in simulations with few galaxies that are very well resolved. And on the bottom right, you have large volume of cosmological simulations with many galaxies, but not as well resolved. And well, to do this kind of modeling, what you would like to have is to be in the top right corner. So if I populate that plot with existing simulations, it seems that there is one that could uh, satisfy this criteria, that is the recent TNG50 simulation. And the TNG50 simulation satisfies most of the criteria that we have. There are disk galaxies. By construction, it's a cosmological simulation, so there is hierarchical growth. And there are over 130 Milky Way-like galaxies that have a bar. But do the properties of the bar satisfy what we want. We want something that looks roughly like the Milky Way. And something that I mentioned earlier that is very important for dynamical evolution are resonances. In particular, the correlation resonance that would drive this radial migration process. That means that the speeds of the bar and the spirals need to be realistic. But we know that past simulations have reported some issues, at least in the cosmological simulations, have reported issues in producing bar pattern speeds that reflect those seen in external galaxies. So here this plot is the illustrious simulation bar pattern speeds, just uh, their distributions. And if you compare that to observations, you see that they tend to have very small pattern speeds. And uh, well, more importantly, if you compare that to what we think is the partner speed of the Milky Way bar, we live really on a side of the plot that is not populated by this simulation. So there's no galaxy that could produce the kind of resonance that we see in the Milky Way. And uh, in the Eagle simulation, you have similar plot. So it, that shows you the pattern speed of the bar as a function of its size. The only thing that I want you to notice on that plot is the, the range of the y-axis. Again, you go from 0 to 12. And per giga year is the same as kilometers per second per kpc to a few percent. So again, you don't have something that is like 40 kilometers per second per kpc. There is no Milky Way-like bar. So now the first thing to do before looking at the orbits of stars in TNG50, we want to check that they have pattern speeds that can produce the uh, resonances that we're going to look for. So you can take one of these um, TNG50 Milky Way-like galaxies and characterize the bar. So the bar will have a strength, a size, and uh, a phase. And to get the pattern speed from single snapshots, you can use the velocity field of the stars with a continuity equation that helps you to predict what the density distribution look like a bit later in time. So for example, if you take all the stars that are in that snapshot and you move them by the small little black arrows, that tells you in which direction the bar is rotating and by how much. So you can do that for many, many, uh, for the 130 Milky Way-like galaxies on the simulation and compare that to observed galaxies. So here is the compilation of um, observed disk galaxies. I just stacked the different surveys together. And if you op overplot uh, TNG50 uh, results, you would get something like this. So the average pattern speed in the Milky Way light galaxies in TNG50 at relative zero, it's about 35 kilometers per second per kpc which is really close to the pattern speed of the Milky Way bar that is currently measured. It's about 40. Now we have to be careful. We shouldn't compare these two histograms directly because there are a lot of observational effects that went into the colored histograms that I didn't account for. But at least the ranges uh, are now comparable and we have bars that can rotate fast. So now we'll finish on uh, something else. 
or one point further that is not only the pattern speeds of bars today, but also the past pattern speeds of the bar that will also influence the overall evolution of the galaxy. And what we see is that these um, pattern speeds have a very complex history. So here, each line is one of these 130 galaxies. At redshift zero, these are the pattern speeds I just showed you before at uh, 13.47 uh, uh, giga year. And a few giga years ago, they had a much wider range of pattern speeds. And in between, they can have a lot of things that happens. At late times, they tend to slow down. So at late time, you have resonances that slowly move out, which is also very important for secular evolution. So now how do that affect the orbits of stars uh, in these galaxies is a topic for a different talk. So we come to my conclusions now. So the first thing is that in the Milky Way, we can see effects that shape disk galaxies. And the reason why we see these effects better in the Milky Way is that we have access to physical scatter. We have star by star information and not just integrated properties. Second, the secular evolution is strong, but it can be cold such that a star in a circular orbit today can come from much further away and we won't see it kinematically. And finally, to make this modeling that was very simple better, it's good to get inspired from uh, up-to-date simulations. And so far, all I've done is just one check um, that could help disentangling the drivers. And so the bars seem to be realistic enough now. So I thank you for your attention and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Anish. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Um, or you know, you can even write the question directly in the chat. That's your choice. So while we wait for questions to appear in the chat or hands to be raised, I have a general question for you, which is I couldn't help noticing from your CV that you've done, you've changed for being so young, you've changed many places where you lived and how do they compare with each other in terms of doing science? So you got your undergrad in France, you went to Sweden for your master's degree and then you moved to Germany. How was the experience different as being a scientist and a woman scientist in these different environments? Okay, um, well, when I was in Toulouse, it was mostly during the bachelor studies where the, the gender balance is quite even uh, still at that stage for studying physics. So I didn't really have um, an intuition of uh, what it is to be a scientist, um, a female scientist. But when I moved to Sweden, uh, it was very interesting because I moved there in 2015 and it's just at the time where they introduced new pronouns in the language. So they introduced the pronoun hen, that is they. So just at that time, I got very educated on uh, gender and uh, inclusiveness. So that, that was a very interesting moment. And now that I've moved uh, to Germany at MPIA, it's also a very inclusive environment. So I, I've, I've been very lucky so far. Okay, that sounds good. Even if Germany has very, Generally speaking, Germany, and I'm not speaking necessarily about MPIA, but uh, Germany has not a particularly good gender balance yeah. um, in science, especially in academia. It's not particularly encouraging to women to go into a career in, in academic science because there are so few women out there. Yeah, that is um, true. There are many groups that uh, are working on, on that to improve. Yeah, I know. That's, that's kind of an unfortunate event that I hope, I know that they're working hard to, to, you know, even the government itself is committing time and funding to change that. So hopefully there will be some effect. Okay. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Anyone has any questions? No, I cannot see any hands raised, but maybe I'm not seeing um, anything. Well, I had one curiosity, meanwhile, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a, <clears throat> a plot in which you present the effect <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> the change of the age uh, radius gradient with at different times a few slides ago. Oh, yes. Several slides ago. Uh, you were presenting a rather limited age range, though, for that. Do you have comments about how that behaves with a larger age range? Um, let me find it. Yeah, yeah, find, yeah. That one. 
Yes, yes. Do you have a comment of how that behaves with a larger age range? Because this is a rather small age range. Wish. Yes, so I think you could just rescale the, the y-axis to the larger age range and the slope would change in a similar way, but just okay. the slope itself would, would rescale. Okay, all right. So you think it's like a, okay, so it's uniform in a way. It's just in a larger range. That was my one curiosity. Um, the other curiosity was when you say that you were simulating stars with um, a birthplace and a birth time, Oh, or birthday. Yeah. Yes. Um, are you using, which IMF are you using? It doesn't matter. Oh, uh, wait. I yep. haven't changed the IMF, so I, I can't okay. tell whether it matters. And the IMF okay. comes in only when I want to look at the selection function of my stars. Because yeah, I'm, indeed, indeed. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking of, exactly. Yeah, right, because I'm modeling red clump stars and they have their specific age distribution. Yeah, yeah. That, yes, exactly. So okay. it matters most for the star formation history and the age distribution of the stars, and it doesn't matter for the rest. Now, mm -hmm. there are many more limitations for the star formation history that I, I'm sure doesn't, don't come from the IMF, but from the fact that age uncertainties are very large the population of stars that I use is mostly two giga year old. So I have very few old stars to constrain the star formation history of a long time ago. So I think this would be the most important things that limit this modeling. Okay, thank you. There is a question um, from the chat. Oh, uh, sorry, who wants to, to speak? Who, who started speaking? There was a voice. Anyway, there is a question in the chat. Kazi, if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask it directly. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for your wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, in the beginning, you, you talked about interaction of these stars with satellites. And we know, right, that, that there is a number of them. Gaia has shown very nice results of this and how they disturb um, stars in the disk, how do they disturb their, their kinematics? How, how would this affect your results that you got for, for the radial uh, mixing, radial migration? Okay, so if the interaction between the satellites and the disk are not as uh, stochastic as those that I presume are to be with the spiral arms, then I shouldn't model it as a random walk. Uh, now, as we have seen the Gaia data, the most obvious ways of, say, of seeing that the disk is perturbed by the satellites is in the vertical motions, not in the radial motions. So I think it would be very important to account for it for the vertical motions. Now, for the radial motions, you know, there have been some um, suggestions that satellites could excite the disk and cause spiral structures to come in. And then these spiral structures could change the radial motions of the stars. So it's true that my model isn't uh, detailed uh, enough at all to, to study the effect of satellites. But this would be uh, important in the future. All right, we have Marco who wants to ask a question. Marco, Marco go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, OK. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? Yeah, yeah loud and clear. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nash. Uh, I, well, uh, thank you for the talk. And uh, I have just two curiosity about uh, one is about uh, how do you decide uh, the initial iron over hydrogen in your in your model? Because uh, in the corner plot, they just see that uh, the gradient is set, uh, like just the gradient is set. Uh, so you, uh, you decide, uh, we can say, you say data driven, but how do you decide the initial iron over hydrogen at different radii? And then the other question is, uh, well, if you say that uh, the age uncertainty is of, of more or less 30% uh, in the red clump stars, uh, you know, um, for stars of six giga years means that uh, quite like uh, two giga years of uncertainty there are. And uh, if uh, like this has a big impact, uh, in your uh, estimation of the, you can say the diffusion, you know, because uh, if there is a spread in, you know, uh, three giga, well, the age range is uh, five, six giga years and the age uncertainty is two, I don't know. Well, maybe the first is more uh, 
clear the first, the first question is more clear than the second but i'm sorry for that no problem they're, they're both clear so how do i decide the uh, initial metallicity so at first i took um, minus one dex uh, because first that's how previous modeling that i inspired my model from was doing but more importantly if you look at the metallicity of the oldest stars uh, at the center of the disk which is exactly how i pinged pinned my model to be the oldest clusters at that age have about a metallicity of uh, minus one dex. So that's how I calibrated it. Uh, for the second question, uh, do the age uncertainties affect the results? So I did a few tests with different age data sets. So from, for the same red crumb stars, I asked two or three collaborators to give me four different age uh, sets with different methods. And some of them were 30% or estimated 30% uh, uncertainty, others estimated 20% uncertainty. And this gave very different star formation histories. One of them told me that the, well, one of them resulted in the best fit that implied outside in growth instead of inside out growth, just to give you an idea of how wrong uh, the results could be in the inside out growth part. Now this specific data set was using parallaxes and there were a few issues with the parallaxes. The other two data set were using only spectra and calibrated that on astro seismology. But regarding the radial migration, there was no difference in the results. So the most important error comes from the star formation history where you directly rely on the age distribution. Whereas for radial migration, you work roughly at given age, how much scatter is there in the metallicity relation? And that can be much better constrained by the, the young stars. Okay, thank you. And just a comment, it could be nice if, uh, like you, with your model, if you're actually coupled uh, uh, the star formation history with uh, uh, not parametric chemical evolution, but with uh, physical chemical evolution, because maybe, well, the, the I think that this, uh, uh, the first uh, like uh, calibration of iron over hydrogen uh, is uh, one of the uh, so I think uh, one of the big, big issues of on, on this model. If you couple just uh, uh, with the with the star formation history with uh, uh, the real chemical evolution, we can say with uh, the ejecta for for various stars, uh, I think the results will be much. They are robust, but they will be even much more. Is yes, I, I agree, that. yes. This would be very interesting to do. So one thing that was limiting me so far is I wasn't entirely sure how long it takes to compute a chemical enrichment model because I need something to go very fast in order to you mm -hmm. know, compute a likelihood function on so many stars. Mm -hmm. But I've started doing some things along these lines, but I, I don't have results yet. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions or comments, Renee? All right. If not, I would like to thank you again for this wonderful talk. I really I personally appreciated it. And I hope many in our audience did the same. You heard many compliments. So uh, we thank you very much for participating. And we will reconvene with the next Laura Bassi speaker in a month. Um, and I hope to see you all there. Um, goodbye and have a good rest of the day. Bye.